how to, how to change it, how to solve it, how to resolve it. This is all about addressing conflict, right? So let's um, grab our Bibles, and uh, we're going to start, let's see. <clears throat> let's just do this. Um, why don't you turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll start there. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. Um, let's talk about a, a biblical perspective of conflict, okay? While you're turning there, and I'm just going to come down. I feel like I'm way, way over here. You guys are way over there. I'm just going to, can I come down here, Nicole? Just hang out right here. Okay. Um, and and this, this is sort of the jet tour of the Bible on conflict, and then we're going we're gonna to really slow down. We'll descend in altitude and, and, and look at that development a little more. Closely, but um, let's think first of all. What does the Bible say about disagreements? Yeah, you know what? We have disagreements. Uh, first of all, they should be expected, right? We, we said we, they should be expected because we're idolaters. Anybody know what Romans eight twenty to twenty two talks about? You remember? That's that section where where Paul is telling us. Do, do you understand that when we all sinned, God judged the creation? And because he judged creation, it, it says there in Romans 8, 20, that creation groans. Yeah, it's Paul's way of saying, we live in a fallen, broken world. And you guys understand that, that we look out here, the wife and I were in Sedona this morning, beautiful, love God's creation. And, and we still see God's testimony. We still see all that. But you understand, this world is broken. It's been judged. It's been cursed. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And in a broken, sin-cursed world, amongst broken, sinful people, we're going to have what? Sin. We're not going to get along. We're going to have conflict. We're going to have disagreements. We're sinful people living with other sinful people in a fallen world. So we, sh we should expect disagreements. Secondly, you think, well, what about we're believers, right? We, we have Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have His Word. We have a generation. We, we should be able to get along, right? Well... Yes, we should, but even though we're re redeemed from sin's penalty and power, we still struggle with the presence of sin. Right? Remember Paul in, in, in Romans chapter 7? Uh, can we all identify this when he says, The good that I want to do, I don't always do. And sometimes, if I'm honest with you, I do the very thing I hate. Can you relate to that? So even though we're redeemed, even though we're in Christ, even though we have the Holy Spirit, even though we have the Word, we have a new heart, we, we have all that, we still struggle with this indwelling presence of sin. And that means we're going to have conflict sometimes. But disagreements do not need to turn into conflicts. Um, and for the purposes of our talk this evening, uh, let me define for you what I mean by um, uh, a disagreement and a conflict. What, what do I mean by the difference between the two? A dif the difference between a disagreement and a conflict is that a conflict is going to involve a sinful desire, attitude, or response to a disagreement. Okay, so 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 watch this. Disagreement is um, this is a Kodak camera. Well, I prefer Canon. No, you don't. Okay, you like Kodak. I like Canon. See, that's a that's a disagreement. We we, we don't agree on the type of camera that's best for our needs. But we can have that disagreement without sinning, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the Lord is saying no. Okay, so, all right, we'll let him jump in here later on to explain why. But, uh, yes, but sometimes that disagreement can turn into some sort of sinful exchange, right? Where, where I get angry at somebody, or I withdraw from them, or I call them hurtful names. Or, so that's the difference between a conflict and a disagreement, right? But Scripture says no disagreement, no matter how important, is worth sinning over. Mm -hmm. The reality is, usually the heart of our conflict is pride and selfishness. Pride may be the reason that after I talk to Ward, who probably knows way more about cameras than I do, pride keeps me from saying, well, okay, maybe Kodak does make a better product. That's pride. I don't want to let that go. I want to, I want to insist on my way. Amen. Um, so what does the Bible say about conflicts? Number one, disagreements should be expected. 
because we're sinful people living in a sinful world. Even though redeemed, we still struggle with the presence of sin. And number two, disagreements do not need to turn into conflict. We don't have to go there. And we're going to talk about why we so often go there. By the time we're done tonight, you'll see why we love to take disagreements into conflict. Okay? Uh, let me just give you some um, uh, perspective here on how disagreements can be actually beneficial. Um, we just read in Romans 8 that, that the creation groans because God judged it and cursed creation as, as part of the fall, in response to the fall. But there's good news, too. The good news is God is redeeming uh, his people right now. He, he's doing a work. And, and part of how he is redeeming people, bringing people to himself, is he's using some of the sinful circumstances to do that. In fact, if, if you can get this, um, this, is, this is so helpful to see that conflict is an opportunity for me and the person I'm in conflict with to actually become more like Jesus. Conflict is an opportunity that God wants to redeem. He wants to use it to make us more like Christ. And, and we see some examples of how God does this in Scripture. You remember in, in Acts chapter 6, they have this, this uh, uh, wonderful problem. Right? They have this wonderful problem. Uh, remember what was going on in Acts 6? What was happening with the widows? You remember? This is the part where you talk. But what was going on with the widows in Acts 6? People were taking their property? What's that? Were people taking their property? No. The feeding program? Yeah, they, they were being neglected. Remember, in the, in the daily rationing of food, they're being neglected. So, so what happens? And there, there's, there's this conflict over it, right? What are we going to do with the widows? They're being neglected? Oh, yeah, that's not good. And so they gathered together, these godly men, and they said, well, it's not desirable for us, the apostle said, that we would neglect the word of God to wait tables. But this is a big deal, right? So we, we gathered some qualified godly men who could take over the task of making sure the widows were fed, the daily portion, so, so we could focus on the ministry of the word and prayer. So now you have a conflict that God uses to bring about a group of men in the church that can more faithfully do the ministry. So God takes that and he does something good with it. And the end result, the text tells us at the end of that section, is that the word of God spreads as the church grows. We read it that first hour, God causes all things to work together for good. Uh, and by the way, just let's think about all things for a minute. Does all things include that conflict you had with your spouse this week? Does it include that? That conflict you had with your Children, or your parents, or your boss, or your best friend. What's that? Or the main speaker. Or the main speaker. <laughs> God uses all those things for good. You know, isn't that amazing? God can take the worst things and bring good, Christ-transforming, Christ-conforming transformation in us. And again, we're just we're doing the jet tour here. Just some other verses you can look up on your own. James chapter one. Verse 2, count it all joy, brothers, when you encounter various trials. What? You want me to count what? Count it joy? When I encounter trials? Why? How does, how does that verse go on? What does it say? Do we need to look it up? Let's look it up. You guys are drawing a blank. It's a long week. It's Friday night. Let's look at God's word so that we can see what God does through trials. Okay, This is an important text. James chapter 1. Consider all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. And endurance, let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete. Teleon, it's, it's mature. It's looking more like Jesus. Then you want to look more like Jesus? God says, let me tell you how to do it. I'm going to use a trial. In fact, this isn't the time and place for it, but one of God's favorite things to use to make his children more like his son are trials. And it says here, that, that's what God's going to do. He's going to bring endurance and maturity so that we're lacking nothing. And that's why we can rejoice in our trial, because of what God is doing through it. So disagreements can be beneficial. 
Romans, uh, or Proverbs 27, 17. We are sharpened by one another. It says, iron sharpened iron. So one man helps his brother, helps, helps another. And then some other ones. These are from um, uh, one of our professors, actually. Stuart Scott uh, compiled this list here. Just, just some of the things that God can be doing uh, in conflict. Uh, he helps us be aware of our own sinfulness. Isn't that true? When conflict happens, um, you guys know John Newton? Yeah. The author of Amazing Grace. In his, um, he's got a book of letters edited by a guy named Josiah Bull. B-U-L-L. -L, it's a banner tree title. He's got a letter in there. He's talking about afflictions. He's talking about trials. And he, and he uses this analogy. We were, we were talking about the snakes coming out, you know, because it's warming up, right? Uh, Newton, Newton says, um, afflictions or trials do us good because they help us see our sin within better. And then he uses this analogy. He says, there are some sins that are so subtle, they're like nests of vipers <coughs> that are hidden, that aren't seen until the rod of affliction arouses them, and then we see their venom, and they hiss. We see their venom. <laughs> That's what conflict does. It shows us the snakes inside of us. It shows us the ugly sin within us. And you say, well, uh, that's not a really fun thing to discover. No, it's not. But you can't repent unless you know what the sin is, right? So God uses trials, he uses conflict to show us the sin inside. Um, way back, another one of our professors from Master's Seminary, Master's College, uh, he, he used to say that our hearts are like sponges. And you don't know what's inside until they get squeezed. And that's what trials do. That's what conflict does. It squeezes the sponge of our heart, and then we can see what comes out. So trials can be good. They cause us, uh, number two, to search the scriptures. We see that in the Bible. They stimulate us to turn to God in prayer. You, you, have you had a trial in your family recently that caused your family to get on your knees and pray more recently? God will use trials and conflict to draw us close to him. They help us think carefully about our view. See, we, we think our view is the best view until we have conflict. And what we're supposed to do is say, hmm, well, maybe... Maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I need to think about it more. Maybe I need to study it some more. They help us learn to communicate more effectively. They, they give us an opportunity to practice real servanthood. They present an opportunity to glorify God by our righteous response. And if a disagreement does turn into a conflict, it can be resolved. Now, the reason that we don't usually resolve conflict, I told you a minute ago, is because of our own sin and pride. And those things often keep us from resolving conflict. So let me give you an example of what not to do. Can I do that? An example, this is an example of what not to do. A man from Texas, and yes, I'm sad to admit that he comes from the same state that I do. He remained married to his wife, but did not speak to her for 40 years after a fight over how much money she spent on sugar. True story. So what did this guy do? He said, I, I got an idea. I got, a, I got a great idea. Here's what he did. He took out a lumber saw. He saws their house in half. He nails up planks to cover the raw sides and then moves one of the houses. He brings his backhoe or bulldozer or something, moves the house off into the woods, the one half where his wife was going to be, behind the scruffy pine trees on the same acre of their ground. And there the two, husband and wife, lived out the rest of their days in separate half houses. That's how stubborn and prideful our sinful hearts can be. And that's why very often, instead of resolving our conflict, we don't. Turn and it just gets worse. Now, I ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Are you there? What I want to do, this is the, the bulk of what I want to spend. How much time do we have here, Jim? Until, uh, uh, when, when, when do I need to be done? It's such simple work. I need all night. All right. All right. Wow. <laughs> all right. And you understand that we come from the school where MacArthur takes. How many years to get through three verses or something like that? So that could be a dangerous uh, combination. It's like 8, 8, 30, 45, 45. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Okay, so, so let's talk about um, how disagreements turn into conflicts. And again, this is, this is the part of, of the talk that I, I hope will be most helpful to you. Because understanding the progression of things help us to know how to keep them from happening, and it also helps us to know how to resolve it when it does, okay? So you have a, little chart, you have a chart there. You guys understand that I am a recovering engineer, right? You understand that, right? A recovering former engineer, so I like charts, okay? So let, let's do a little drawing here, shall we? Conflict starts with a disposition. Conflict starts with a disposition. Okay, well, what do I mean by that? Well, we just talked about it, right? We talked about the importance of the heart, of worship, of idols. And uh, look at your Bible with me at 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Um, Paul writes here, Therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Um, in a nutshell, the, the goal of the believer is to please God, to glorify God, or as we said last hour, to worship him alone, okay? And, and if you were paying attention, I said that there's only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Okay. So, so I, want you, I want you to think about this with me. At any moment of our lives, our, our life is being governed by who or what we're worshiping, right? We talked about that. And at any moment, it's either going to be God, I'm seeking to please Him, or it's going to be me, right? So at the moment the wife tells you that dinner is going to be late and the house is a wreck and she didn't get to the bills like she said that day, and that's what you walk into, and, and there is a conflict that develops long before you ever walked in the door, long before those circumstances, in your heart, you were worshiping something. And conflict doesn't start with the circumstances. Conflict starts with the disposition of your heart. It, it starts with who am I worshiping at that moment? Who, who am I seeking to serve? Who am I seeking to to please. And that leads, secondly, to what we want. Who or what we're worshiping leads to what we want, what we might call desires. Desires. Um, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but follow me over to James chapter 1. I'm going to make you go all over your Bible. Is that okay? Can I, can I make you go all over your Bible? We're just in James a minute ago. But turn back there and look this time at chapter 1, uh, later on in the chapter. And uh, we will unpack this in more detail next time, but we're just going to kind of wave our hands at it here so you can see how this works. Um, James chapter 1, uh, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Does anybody have a different translation, verse 14? Carry away and enticed by... Anybody have a different version other than the New American Standard? Okay, read what your what yours says, please. Uh, NIV. Go ahead. Okay, very good. Did you hear what the NIV says? Evil desires, and and in this context, the word lust does not have to do with sexual sin. It's really the word desire. It's and actually strong, I call it a desire on steroids. It's a really, really strong, really passionate, really almost a need, right? So where does conflict start? It starts with who or what I'm worshiping, right? And then who or what I'm worshiping leads to what I want, what I desire, what I need. Okay. So if so in my example, if I walk into the house. And my desire, because I'm worshiping me, is to have my way. I walk into the house with some expectations, don't I? Wife needs to have dinner on the table, kids need to be in order, house needs to be clean, bills need to be paid. I walk in with certain wants, right? But if God is on the throne, I walk in and I, I want to worship God, I walk in saying, I want to serve my wife. I want to love my kids. I want to assist in whatever, you see the difference? 
So my disposition, who or what I'm worshiping, leads to what I want, and what I want then leads to, oh, by the way, the black line is the part that you can't see, because all those things happen in here, right? And that happens in here. So like inner man, outer man. So the next thing you see is, is some difference, some difference, okay? Now what is that? Well, that is the difference, and my example is I want dinner to be at a certain time, and the house to be in a certain order, and the bills to be paid, and whatever other my expectations, that, that's what I want, okay? And I walk in the door, and my wife has a different situation, right? Dinner's going to be late, the house isn't quite ready to be, bills aren't paid yet, and there's some difference. And this is, this is the genius of how God does this. God uses differences. Is there a laser on here? Ooh, look at that. All right. God uses differences to show us what's in our hearts. If there was never any differences, we'd never see what's in here. But a difference uh, is, is what comes along in the conflict. And, and we have differences, right? We come from different backgrounds, different opinions, different preferences. Um, is there like a big debate over like U of A and Arizona State? Do you guys, you guys fight over that like like UCLA and USC back? Do you guys do that here, okay? So there's differences, right? You have Arizona type differences, whatever those are, and it may be that your wife grew up somewhere different than you did. It could be that your boss has a different outlook on how to make the business plan come together than you do, or whatever differences all over the place, and that then leads to a disagreement. So you see. We preachers like to alliterate. That's why they're all D's. You know what I'm saying? Okay. The disposition leads to desire. Desire leads to difference. Difference leads to a disagreement. Now, you understand that the disagreement is not the cause of the conflict. Right. It's the occasion. I'll say that again. The disagreement is not the cause of the conflict. It's the occasion. It's just the context. See, the fact that my wife and I don't always see things the same way does not make us fight. It's just the context in which the fight can start, right? And I think uh, Daryl and Janet have a thing on, on fighting fair tomorrow, so be sure to go to that, right? Is that tomorrow you're going to do that? Yeah. Okay. All right, so they'll, they'll unpack all that for you. Okay, so disposition is desire, desire is to difference, difference to disagreement. And that leads to, you guessed it, detonation. You have World War III in your kitchen. Or while you're driving to church. Oh, yeah. When you're the pastor, right? You, 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 Rick, Rick Holland used to say, does the devil drive in the van with you to church too like he does with us? Right? <laughs> you, remember, you remember saying that? Were you there when he... Yeah. Okay, so that leads to detonation, right? This is the, the, what it is. It's fights. It's quarrels. It's conflicts. And again, we'll talk more about James tomorrow, but uh, James... For one says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war on your members? You want something, and you don't get it, so you commit murder. Um, and, you know, there's an adult version of that, and there's a kid version of that. Um, the, the, the season of life that we're in right now with our youngest child is called potty training. Potty training is being used by God in our house to make my son's mommy and daddy more like Christ through the conflict, through the disagreements, and it's very simple. I want him to use the big boy potty. He doesn't want to use the big boy potty, right? And if I insist that he does, James 4.2, he wants something, he doesn't get it, he commits three-year-old murder. You know, temper tantrum and anger and kicking on the floor, right? There it is. Why? Why? Because we had a difference, we had a disagreement about it, and then there's detonation. And then that leads, and this is the sad reality. This is the, the reality of the illustration of the man who cuts his house in half. That leads to, that leads to, there it is, disintegration. Because left unchecked, conflict destroys relationships. <coughs> and if you don't resolve conflict, it's interesting. If you look up in the New Testament where Satan shows up, you ever done this? You just like put, you know, go to your favorite Bible website that you can type in something and it finds all the verses. Type in devil. 
or Satan. And look at where he shows up. Not a whole lot of times in the New Testament. Not a lot of times in the Old Testament either. You know what one place, one place he shows up? Ephesians chapter 4. When we let the sun go down on our anger, next verse, we give the devil an opportunity. Interesting. Of all the things the New Testament could say about if you do this, here comes Satan. One of the ways, one of the, it's only like three or four times in the Bible. When we don't handle conflict in a biblical way, when we let the sun go down in our anger, we don't repent, we don't seek reconciliation, we don't forgive. When we don't do that, we let the devil into our relationships. We give him an opportunity. And I don't know about you, have you met people that are like this? Bitter? Resentful? Cold or distant? They withdraw? They're withholding forgiveness? You ever met people like that? Mark it. It's probably because they let the sun go down on their anger. They got to the end of this list and they didn't do anything about it. Or what they did was, was insufficient in terms of what the Bible would would unpack. Now, now let's let's look at this. You got does this make sense? You with me? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, watch this. Um, what? Let's back up here. Um, this is the part you can't see. This happens in your heart, and then this comes out here, and then this happens here. What's the red line? represent, do you think? Action. Yeah, action, right. And, and in a sense, assuming that my heart's right and my desires are right, it doesn't have to go down here. The, the red line is, is, is sinful action, right? This, this is where the sin really takes place. And you see, godly people can stop here and have a godly response. That's what we should do. When we have a disagreement, we should be able to have a Christ-like, godly conversation, working together, serving one another, and, and work the problem, in a way. Okay. Now, um, let's, um, let's think about how we can sort of diagnose this. Okay, This is sort of the, this is a schematic, right? That's a good engineering term. This is a schematic. If you were using this with somebody, what, how might you use it? Well, you could do this. And you can help them to ask some very important questions to help them to understand how all this develops. Like, for example, number one, you might ask them, where is the focus of my heart? Who or what am I worshiping? Whose glory am I living for? I was talking to a guy, walked through the door, same thing happened. He gets angry at his wife because uh, it was had something to do with a ranger game or a cowboy game. Or, you know, it's, you know, from Texas, it's easy to get angry about the cowboys. I'm just, just saying. Um, Anyway, that's a whole other topic for another day. But anyway, uh, but you know, help them see where is my focus? Where where is my heart? Whose glory am I living for? And then secondly, you might ask him this: What did I want? What lusts or desires are ruling me? Um, you guys understand that behind every conflict <coughs> is an idol. Behind every conflict is an idol. So in my example, the guy walks in the door, he gets angry at the wife. What was his idol? <coughs> it, you, know, it, it, you know, the big picture is me. Yes, he's worshiping me. He's worshiping himself instead of Christ. But, but what's the functional idol? What is he wanting? What, what is he? Control. Okay, it could be control. <clears throat> it's simpler than that. I mean, that. That very well could be. It's good. It's a good one. But just, just basic. What, what is it? He wants to walk into the house. Order. Okay, it could be order. That's good. Okay, you guys are good. Okay, going, going deeper, just, just, just surface level. He wants to walk into the house and get his way. All right? And there certainly may be order issues that usually go there, and, and you're right. But just in a very basic, superficial, he wants to walk in the door and have his way. That's it. And we love to get our way, don't we? We love to get our way. Help him to see what was he wanting. He had an expectation about dinner being on time. He had an expectation about the bills being paid. He had an expectation about the condition of the house. And those aren't, is it bad to like want dinner on time? Not necessarily, it's not bad. Is it bad to want the house to look sort of like, you know, people 
have worked on cleaning it occasionally. Yeah, that's not a bad desire. Is it wrong to, to expect bills are going to be... No, those are not bad desires. Those are good desires. But what happens when they become ruling desires? What happens when they become needs or things I have to have? What happens? Then I sin when I don't get them. That's a good category. That's, that's a good diagnostic question. Um, if I sin when I don't get something, I'm probably wanting it too much. So what do you do there? Well, we, we learned about it last hour. You, you have to repent. Lord, I am worshiping myself right now. I, 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 me is the most important thing in the universe. Not pleasing you. Not worshiping you. And frankly, I'm not walking the door wanting to honor you, wanting to serve my wife. I'm walking in wanting to be served. And so what, happened, what needs to happen in the heart is repentance, confession, and forgiveness. Now, let's stop right here for a minute. Of these three areas, disposition desires, difference and disagreement, detonation and disintegration, when we have conflict with people, what's the first part do, that we usually want to address? What's the first area that we usually want to address when we have conflict? Right here. But see, sweetheart, you're just not, you're just not seeing it, right? You, you, just, you, don't, you don't have enough information. We, see, when we have conflict, we want to go right here and explain why our way is really the best way. That's what we want to do. It is. Thank you. Do you want Yes, Kodak. I got it. I wrote it down. Got it. But see, the Bible says this is not the first place you go to resolve a conflict. This is the first place you go. You see that? Because the conflict didn't start here. It started here. It started with a wrong heart disposition. And then it, it started with some wants, some desires that became too important. The conflict doesn't start here. It starts here. You say, well, now we can deal with that. No, we can't deal with that. We have, to, we have to deal with sin in the heart. Then second, we have to deal with sin in the behavior, in the action, like Jim said. We need to ask ourselves the question, how did I sin in my response? Well, see, I chewed out my wife. I was not loving her like Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. I was being a poor example to my children who were watching all of it. I was making things around the house more important than the relationships of people that are most close to me, right? And you go on and on and on and on. i got to confess a lot of sin here. And how I responded, my hurtful words, my unkind speech, my angry outburst. And then I need to deal with, if it's, if it's digressed to this, with bitterness in the heart. How am I currently sinning? You know, you might be helping somebody, or, or maybe you're doing it. Maybe you're here and you have some conflict that is unresolved tonight, right? And, and you're, you're down here. You're, you're, you're stewing over something. You're bitter. You're cold. You're distant. There's someone you haven't talked to in months or weeks or years. And... And we realize, I'm, I'm currently sinning against somebody. Because I'm down here. I have not repented. I have not uh, sought reconciliation. So not only do I need to deal with repentance in my heart, now I need to deal with repentance at the action level, in my behavior. And then, and then, once I have dealt with sin in the heart and sin in my behavior, now I can deal with the difference. And I'll show you in a minute why you can't deal with the difference until you've dealt with sin in your heart. Okay? The Bible says, and I'll, I'll prove this to you in a minute, the Bible says we are not qualified to deal with our differences in relationship with other people until we have dealt with our own sins first. Actually, Jesus says our own logs. That gives you a hint on the passage. So once I've dealt with sin in the heart, I've dealt with my sin in the behavior. Then I can come and say, well, okay, what, what, what was the context? What was the difference that sort of set all this off? Is it one of preference? Is it one of sin and righteousness? Is it one of conscience or wisdom? You say, what do all those mean? A preference issue is just that. Ward, can I talk camera brands again, or should I use a different thing? Great. Okay, Kodak or Canon? That's a preference issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's some pastoral hope there. All right. Did you know we get all bent out of shape over preference issues? You, you got it. 
We get all, all sorts of upset over preference issues. You can't find a chapter and verse about it. If you can't find a chapter and verse about it, it's probably a preference issue. We get all sorts of... Oh, that, and now, there are some things that the Bible does have a chapter and verse about. We call those sin and righteousness issues. Okay? If, if I'm talking to um, a, a group of uh, uh, two college students and they are sleeping together and living together, I can say on the basis of the Bible that that is sin and they should not be doing that. They say okay? it's a preference. Yeah, they're, they're going to say it's a preference. which is ready to <laughs> prove it to them. Right? You've got to take them to a chapter and verse. And sometimes a conflict uh, erupts. This happens... Uh, in counseling all the time, where, where people are getting angry at me, they're having conflict with me because I'm telling them what God says, and they don't like what God says. Uh, sometimes that happens with our children. Sometimes, sometimes I'm the one sinning, and my wife is the one saying, you know what, Keith? God's word says this. Amen. And we need that. Terrible. An issue of conscience would be... Um, Basically, an issue where, where we, we call it a Christian freedom issue, where Christians are going to disagree, disagree usually between like a, a less mature, like a brand new baby Christian, and a more mature Christian. And you can read about examples of that in, for example, um, texts like uh, Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And then a wisdom issue would be an issue where the Bible gives you principles but doesn't give you an answer. Okay? Uh, I hope I don't step on any toes here, but. Um, music. Music. Okay. Now, does the Bible have some things to say about music? Sure it does. Does the Bible tell you what kind of music to listen to? <coughs> I would say that's a Christian, Christian wisdom issue. Where, there you go. Where the wisdom. Bible gives some right. principles and allows Christians to work that out in wisdom and application. And sometimes, sometimes, godly people are going to come to different conclusions. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. All right? So preference, sin righteousness, conscience, wisdom. And then the last thing is, with a disagreement, how does God call me to respond to this difference? What should I have done? Okay, in the example I gave, what should that husband have done when he walked in and, and the, the house was uh, like that when he came in? Picked up a broom. Picked up a broom. Very good. How about going loving on his wife a little bit? You must have had a really hard day, sweetheart. Right? Can I help? What can I do to help? Um, how, how can I serve my wife, serve my kids? Pick up a broom. That's right, real practical way. Okay? Now, and, and then you work together to solve the problem biblically. There's your resolution. Okay? So you have to start with sin in the heart, then you deal with sin in the action. Then you can talk about whatever the problem was, whatever the precipitating issue is. Now, let me stop right here. Does that make sense? Think about a recent conflict you had. Can you see yourself in this? Can you see that when that conflict happened, it wasn't Jesus you were worshiping and it was something else? Right. And that there was something that you were wanting too much that you didn't get? And that that led you to ungodly behavior when someone disagreed or, or crossed you in some way? Do you see that? Do you, do you see how when, when all these happen in relationships, this is inevitable unless you do something about it? I had a, uh, another lady in our church that's a counselor. Uh, she and I were working together, team counseling a lot in our church with a, a gal that came in. And she was needing to go back and seek reconciliation with a sibling of hers of something that happened like 25 years ago. A Bible-believing, professing Christian. When the Bible says you give a devil an opportunity, it's not real hard to see. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, how many of you have read Ken Sandy's The Peacemaker? Anybody read that? Okay. Actually, I'm so glad. Um, that, that, is that a must-read? Daryl, would you agree with me on that? That's a must-read book. Must-read book. Okay. Must read. Um, it's, it, in my, yeah, in my opinion, it is one of the finest books on, on thinking about biblical reconciliation, confession, forgiveness. And uh, so this, I, I'm really borrowing Ken Sandy's outline here in a procedure. Okay. So uh, this is adapted from his, what he calls the four G's. 
How do you actually, that's kind of how you understand conflict. How do you actually resolve it now, okay? How, how do you resolve the conflict? Well, we learned last hour, we, we said it today, the goal in everything, including conflict resolution, is what? We glorify God. Sometimes, sometimes the other party doesn't want to resolve the conflict like you do. But you know what? You can glorify God in yourself. Yes, sir. Appropriate to ask, ask the question. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I appreciate the scenario and, mm -hmm. and the examples are a good one. But let's say it's recurring. So yeah. tomorrow, I have a bad day. We understand how, yeah. I mean, how can I help. And the next night, you know, so tomorrow, you'll get to the bills. Okay. And yeah. tomorrow comes. Well, didn't get a chance to do that today. Excellent. The next day comes. Oh, whoops. I had to go to the store. I did 20 other things. And right. that didn't happen again. So it's a recurring, Very good, yeah. you know, it's a difference between I made a mistake today or I have a recurring problem that I can't get over. Mm -hmm. You know, drank too much one day, but okay, that's it. But if, oh, the next day I drank a little bit too much, or the next day. So you're saying, what, what do you do in the scenario where the other person has a reoccurring problem and they're not repenting, they're not changing? Right. Okay. Remember the, I'll, I'll back up here a second. Remember we talked about this? How is God calling me to respond to this difference? One of the ways that God might be calling you to respond would to think about a text like Luke 17, 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. So that's, that's just as much a part of this as it might be to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Loving his wife might be saying, you know what, uh, dear, I, I've noticed that it has become a regular pattern that you don't pay the bills on time, just to pick an example. And, and what God would want me to do as, as, your, as your brother in Christ, I'm not just your husband, but your brother in Christ, is to call you to repent of that, the way Luke 17, 3 describes. And, and to call her to repentance and to work with her on that in, in all the biblical ways that it would do. So, so yeah, I appreciate you saying that because there may be additional biblical counsel that would come into play in that scenario. Does that address your question? All right, so number one in the four Gs is to glorify God. Number two, and I will have you turn here, is to look at uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. The second G is to deal, actually it's not G, in, in, in Sandy's book it's get the log out of your own eye, that's how he does the G. Uh, we call it deal with your own sin first. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Uh, verses 1 and following. Do not judge lest you be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be judged to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Um, there's so much we can take out of this. You know, so, uh, sin is like a carnival mirror. You guys ever stood in front of a carnival mirror? It makes my sins look smaller, and it makes the sins of others look bigger, right? Well, when, I'm, when I have sin in my heart, that's what I do. I minimize my own sin, and then I maximize the sins of others. But notice what Jesus said. Look back at the text. He says in verse 5, Then you will see clearly to help your brother. The implication is, until I deal with the sin in my own heart, I'm not seeing it clearly. You know that? When we have, we have sin here, sin becomes a lens through which we see everything. Now, we had an issue recently um, with some folks in our church, and it became obvious that they were overreacting at a situation. And we go, why the big, why the drama, why the emotion? And you know what it was? There was something in their heart that they hadn't dealt with involving the situation. And that unresolved issue in their heart was clouding their perception of what was going on. And, and that lens, that, that unrepentant sin, was like a pair of glasses. They were viewing the situation through, and they were getting way over the top in their reaction. Because they hadn't dealt with that sin in their own heart. And Jesus said, okay, so here's what you need to do. You need to remove 
the log from your own eye first. You need to deal with your own sin first. So in conflict, if it's me and my wife, I don't say, now, sweetheart, let's talk about what you did. I start by saying, I need to confess my sin first and deal with my own sin first there. And notice what Jesus said. When I do that, I identify and repent of my log. You guys have a log list, by the way? Do you have a log list? Do you know your own logs? Good question. When we repent of our logs, it brings three things. Jesus said it brings three things. It brings clarity. I can see to help my brother. Two, it brings. I hope it brings. I really wants to bring. There you go. Ability. Now I can really help my brother. And as a byproduct, what, 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 you ever notice this? When you confess your sin, when you go first and confess your part of the deal, what does it bring? Humility. You ever seen a conflict where, I don't want to admit what I'm wrong. I don't want to admit. You, it was you. It was you. But when one party humbles themselves and confesses their sin, it brings an air of humility that very often spreads. <clears throat> Daryl, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I'm convinced that in a marriage counseling situation, if the couple stops blaming their spouse and starts dealing with their own sins first, there is hope for them. But I have some couples that will, they refuse to deal with their own logs. And all they want to do is tell me how bad their spouse is. And I've just found that that's, that's like a clue whether or not they're going to grow and change or not. It's such a big deal. I think mostly because it brings humility. Number three, in how we're going to resolve the conflict, we need to repent and seek forgiveness comprehensively. There, there's the text that I mentioned, Luke 17, 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he comes to you seven times the day saying, I repent, then we forgive him. And this is where um, I think Ken Sandy is very important. I put these uh, in your notes here if you don't have them. If you've read Sandy, then you know these things. He calls them the seven A's of confession. You guys heard of these? These are in your notes, right? I put them there? Okay. The, the seven A's of confession. Just very, very practical. What does confession look like? Number one, you address all involved. Number two, you avoid making excuses. Number three, you admit specifically both your attitude and your action, what you did. Number four, you acknowledge the hurt. Number five, you accept the consequences. Number six, you alter your behavior. And number seven, you ask for forgiveness. That's, what, that's, that's a robust view of biblical confession. I think Sandy's uh, outline there is very, very helpful. Okay. And then the four promises of forgiveness. What, when you forgive somebody, what are you saying? You're basically making four promises to them. And these are all based on uh, really how God forgives us is where they come from. If we think about what the Bible says about God, it's forgiveness of us. Uh, Sandy says, when you say, I forgive you to somebody, what you're basically saying is you're promising four things. I will not dwell on this incident. I call that the mind test. You've got to stop replaying the video in your head. If you've forgiven somebody, you discipline yourself to not replay the video in your head. Number two, the history test. You will not bring it up and use it against the person again. So once you forgive somebody, you don't say, why, you just did that last week. You know, you don't do that if you've forgiven them. Number three, the gossip test. You don't talk to others about it. And number four, the relationship test. Sometimes I call it the junior high girls test. You know what I'm talking about? Two girls, two junior high girls, they get at each other. They're best friends when they walk into the gym for a wana or whatever at night. They get into some conflict. You need to forgive her. Okay, I forgive you. You need to forgive her. I forgive you. Okay. And she goes over there, and she goes over there. And they spend the rest of the night not talking to each other. But they forgave each other. At least they supposedly forgave each other, right? That's not, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness means you're friends again. Forgiveness means reconciliation. I mean, just, just imagine if, if God did that, right? Well, I forgive you, Keith, but um, I'm not sure we're going to be so close anymore. I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that, you know, this whole adopting into my family, eh, we, we might have to work out some sort of arrangement. And when you pray, well, maybe I'll be around, maybe I won't. I mean, I forgive you and all, but, but we're not going to be, we're not going to be in, fel in fellowship like it used to be. Right? Just imagine if God... If, if that's what he did, that's not what he does. Praise God, that's not what he does. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So we don't do the junior high girls thing. We don't do that. The relationship test means I will not allow this incident to stand between us. 
or hinder our personal relationship. Okay, so that's a primer on the seven A's and the four promises. Read Ken Sandy if you want to read more. Last part, we deal with the precipitating issue. Remember that middle section? What was the disagreement? Well, I want to paint the wall blue and she wants to paint it green. I think we should do this and she thinks we should do that. Whatever the precipitating issue is, it's really important that you start by praying. We pray and we ask God for wisdom to help us to resolve this. And number two, letter A, or excuse me, letter B, what's the problem? We can't agree on blank. Letter C, it is running late. There he goes. Uh, we want to decide what things we can uh, be agreed upon. We agree we need to paint the house. Okay, well, that's good. We can agree on that. And then the last thing, and this is where it gets a little tricky. Remember I told you, what, what sort of disagreement are you having? If it's a preference issue, what does the Bible call you to do if you and somebody is disagreeing on a preference issue? Does anyone know Philippians 2, 3, and 4 for memory? Do you want me to recite it? I'll start it for you. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another is more important than Chloe knows it. Let each of you regard one another as more important than yourself. Let them have their way. Isn't that great? Problem solved. Problem solved. What if it's a sin issue, like in the scenario that, that uh, Michael brought up? Okay? If it's a reoccurrent uh, I think being a poor steward, being responsible, being a good steward means we pay our bills on time. That's part of our Christian testament. It's part of honoring God. Well, what do we do there? Well, we may have to rebuke or call that person to repentance so that they can repent and change. That's what you do if it's a sin issue. If it's a conscience issue, the Bible will tell us in Romans 14, we don't use our freedom to cause another person to sin. The more mature Christian with, gives up his freedom in the area so as to not cause someone else to stumble in an area of Christian freedom. If it's a wisdom issue, we open our Bibles. We pray for wisdom, and we ask God to guide us through his word. And if we're not sure, that's why God gives us the church. We have godly pastors, godly elders, godly friends, godly uh, teachers, and, and Sunday school workers. And, and we get together and we say, you know what? God made us a community. He made us a body. We need one another. We need some help. And I don't know about you, I've got some folks in my church where when my wife and I are having trouble working out something, or maybe it's an issue with another brother or sister, and I don't know, I go to those people. And I say, here's the scenario. Will you help me? Will you help me to see what I need to do in that situation? Okay? And we deal with that precipitating problem. All right. Um, let me talk about some resources and we'll call it a night, okay? Um, we'll overlap this with some uh, with the talk on anger tomorrow. But uh, there's Ken Sandy's The Peacemaker. Um, wonderful little book by Stuart Scott called Communication and Conflict Resolution. These are both booklets that you can use in helping somebody. Uh, this pamphlet right here, Biblical Peacemaking, it's about well, about 30 pages, Daryl. It's, it's real short. Um, I use this pamphlet in counseling probably more than any, any other pamphlet because it just walks people through confession and forgiveness and all those things. Uh, Jay Abbs, uh, classic work from Forgiven to Forgiving, one of the best books on forgiveness uh, to help you there. Okay, about two minutes for a couple questions or just want to call it a night. It's been a long week. Let's call it a night. <laughs> uh, Father, thank you uh, for this time and your word that even though we are sinful people living in a sin-cursed world and we are going to have conflict, uh, that because of Christ who redeems us from our idols, who calls us to repent, that as we become more like Christ, we can learn how to grow and change and to reconcile with those that we have conflict with. Father, I pray that there are, there are hard relationships that we all have, and you know what those hard relationships are. Father, you know what our marriages are like. You know what our relationship is like with our parents. You know what our relationships are like with extended family or bosses or coworkers, people at church. Yeah. Father, I pray, uh, would you help us as a result of this time in your word tonight, seeing what your word would call us to do and be. 
that we would identify and repent of things that we want too much and are leading us to conflict, that you would help us to gladly think about considering one another as more important than ourselves, that we would think about serving rather than being served. Father, if there are people that have sin in their life that they don't see or is not confessed, would you give us the grace to go to them and confront them in a biblically helpful way? And all in all, Father, might we learn to forgive the way that you have forgiven us. I love you, and we want to be a people that is growing in unity, the way Ephesians 4 says, as an example to the lost world around us. It's our love for one another that testifies the gospel. So would you help us to do that? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.